I have the incredible honor to introduce a dear friend of mine, uh, Denise Merrill, who happens to be the Secretary of the State of Connecticut. So when we were talking about some of the rules, I was thinking, you know, don't disclose too much in front of the actual elections official for the state of Connecticut. <laughs> Denise is, is the elections officer um, and, and is on top of all the elections and the laws that happen regarding elections in Connecticut. So um, don't tell her too much. So um, anyway, Denise, Denise uh, has been in office for um, Two terms. She's serving her second term, and she is running for her third term, which I am uh, thrilled um, that she's doing that for us. And I think that is terrific. She, um, we served together in the House of Representatives um, for the whole time that um, I was there, in my early years, until she ran uh, to become Secretary of the State. She held the distinction of being a uh, majority leader, a woman majority leader. Um, were you the first? No, more of the second. Second. In, in the 350 whole, years. In 350 years. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, hold the leadership post like that. So um, certainly uh, something we're very proud of. She has an, I'm not going to go into it, but she had an amazing career um, in the state legislature. And so many of the things that we're talking about here today, like the uh, Community Investment Act, were, all took place while um, Denise was majority leader. So with that, I introduce uh, Denise Merrill, who um, I understand is has been president of the Secretaries of State nationally, and she also has been um, the head of the Democratic, president of the uh, Democratic Secretaries of the State. I do want to mention, because sometimes she misses this, she is only one of 11 um, secretaries of the state in the United States that are Democrats. The, all the rest have been slowly whittled away, and these are our election officers in all of our um, states. And this trend is something that we should really be concerned about, and I'm sh sure she'll uh, address some of that. Denise? as I have been in the last year since all of you have been out there forming groups, not sitting back after, well, we won't talk about the 2016 election. Nobody was more depressed than I was, I can tell you that. Um, but since that time, we haven't let go of it. Um, and just this last local election, we had a record number of women running for office who won at the local level. And that might be the most important thing that's happened from all this, because women are not sitting back anymore. <laughs> and uh, 22 towns, now I can't help it, I have to be a little partisan here, because the, the issues I'm gonna talk about have become partisan in a very, in a way I would not have predicted, and, and that's around voting rights. So what I wanna do tonight is one thing, I wanna give you one more thing to be really angry about. And I, you know, I know I don't really have to do that, but you have to be angry when you hear <coughs> that voting rights are under assault in this country in a way I never thought I would see in my lifetime. Uh, because I come all the way back from the 70s, uh, where, you know, and the Voting Rights Act of 65, and we really all thought, I think, that the right to vote was pretty much a decided thing. I mean, there were not questions about who had a right to vote anymore. Voting Rights Act really codified the Civil War and the freeing of the slaves and making black people able to vote finally, really. Until about eight years ago. And you started hearing about uh, new restrictions on voting uh, in a number of states. Not here, because by that time I was Secretary of State, it wasn't going to happen here, not on my watch. Uh, so, what you started seeing were uh, laws passing about, uh, primarily about photo ID laws that started passing. And I'm, I'm really heartened to know that most people seem to know about this across the state when I talk about it, which is encouraging. Um, and you started seeing it, and the insidious thing about it was it seemed kind of harmless, 
really. Everybody would say, well, what's wrong with getting an ID when you go in to vote? I mean, what's the problem? We have to have IDs for everything. And of course, here in Connecticut, we've had an ID law that you should present an ID for 25 years. The uh, reason I know that is I first ran for office in the early 90s. Uh, Oprah Bird and I came in around the same time. I think I was there a little longer. But, and I still remember, you know, you go up to the, uh, the voting desk, and uh, I, I'm from Mansfield, by the way. I represented uh, stores, AKA Mansfield, UConn, and all that, uh, for 17 years in the General Assembly. And when people would come up, they would say, you know, the, the checker would say, well, can you present your, uh, the usually ask for a driver's license. And people would say, Mark, you've known me for 30 years. Why are you asking me for a driver's license? That's ridiculous. Um, so people were outraged at the time. Now we've kind of gotten used to it. But there's a difference because Connecticut's law is flexible. If you don't happen to have a driver's license or a picture ID with you, you can use some other form of identification. That's the difference. The laws that started passing around the country were very specific about exactly what kind of ID you had to have. The most notorious was in Texas, where they passed a law that said, that had a list of things you could use. And you could use your gun license, but not your student ID. <laughs> even though they both had pictures on them. So you can see this was a very, very kind of clever way of starting to restrict certain people. And, and, and sometimes it wasn't a, it's a restriction exactly, more, more a discouragement, I think. Um, and so you started seeing this pass throughout the country. And there was a particular Secretary of State, and Roberta's right, at the same time, millions of dollars were spent, particularly in swing states, to impact Secretary of State races which has always been kind of a, you know, it's another level down. It's not governor, it's not Congress. It's an office most people didn't pay too much attention to. Um, and usually it's sort of a stepping stone to something else. But all of a sudden you saw millions of dollars being poured into places like Ohio, Indiana, Colorado, Florida, and some other places to impact those elections. And they did impact them. And we lost, it, it used to be there were like 50% of the secretaries were Democrats and 50% Republicans, you know, more or less. And now we are down to a very small number and it's making a difference. Uh, you can see it in the activities of these new secretaries, newer since about 2010, uh, where they have done things like in Ohio, the Secretary of State canceled early voting in three counties only. Um, and you can guess which ones they were. Uh, so things like that started happening. Uh, there, there was then, so I can't actually blame this on the Trump administration, much as I would like to, uh, because it really was happening for a long period of time. And a lot of it was the brainchild of one man, who was the Secretary of State of Kansas. <laughs> he was also, his name is Chris Kobach, some of you may have seen there have been several profiles of him in uh, like the New Yorker, I believe. Uh, and he, uh, he's Harvard graduate, Harvard Law, uh, Oxford, Cambridge. All of, he's got a pedigree and he's a very bright guy. Um, and he has been the architect of much of this legislation through an organization called ALEC, the American Legislative Electoral whatever. Um, and it, it is a, um, a foundation that encourages conservative legislation and brings together uh, legislators from all over the country, paid for by uh, big corporations mostly, and, and and they come up with model legislation that gets then passed in each state or attempted to be passed. We have had them here, by the way. Uh, photo ID laws. I have managed to uh, kill them every year, uh, along with a lot of other help. And by the way, nothing is done alone. You know, you need help for everything. I can sort of champion certain things, but obviously you need a legislature and a governor and, and, and the population to support the ideas. So, so that's where you're gonna come in, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so that's what started happening, and it certainly was happening here, but I have to tell you, I do believe that this issue is the most important issue you will deal with because it underpins everything else. If you don't have representatives that represent what you care about, 
These things are going to happen here too. It can happen quickly. Uh, you saw it in Wisconsin, you're seeing it now in North Carolina. Those used to be states with very civilized politics, just like Connecticut, I like to think. And lest any of you think I'm a, a rabid partisan, I am not. Actually, uh, one year when we used to have these uh, uh, ratings of legislatures, and uh, we would have, our colleagues would vote on who was, you know, it's almost like high school, like who has the best hair. You know, but it was other things. And so I was voted by my colleagues uh, most, uh, most effective legislature, legislature, but also something I'm proud of, most respected by the other side of the aisle. And now more than ever, I think that's important. But this is an issue that we can't give on because it is being manipulated uh, very systematically. It's along with the gerrymandering, uh, the, the impact of money in politics that's going into these races and others, and I'm sure you all know about that. Uh, so I think the only way to fight back is to go the other way. Because if you really believe, as I do, that our democracy is only strong when we have everybody participating if we make changes to that, it will be to our cost uh, for all of us because everyone must feel they're part of something. And once they're out there voting, then they start learning about the issues because then you care about the issues. It's something I've been very concerned about for all my career, 40 years now, is civic education because I really believe there's just not enough of it anymore. There's vast ignorance about how our system works um, and, and honestly, a little, you know, just a little commercial for civic education. It's because it's not on the test anymore. We're testing for skills. We're not testing for things like civic education. And, you know, the stories we used to hear, particularly at the elementary school level, by the way. But anyway, that's another, that's another subject. Um, so we have to fight back, and that's what you're doing by being here tonight, trying to learn about these issues. So I just told you about photo ID. Uh, the next thing that happened is once President Trump came into office, almost the first thing he did was to claim that three to five million people voted illegally, right? Remember that? And so, uh, with no, no evidence whatsoever. This plays into the narrative that's creating all of this, which is that all kinds of people who shouldn't be voting are voting. There is no evidence of that. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons it makes no sense at all, because frankly, if I'm an undocumented person, the last thing I'm going to do is go try to vote because I'm going to get caught. I mean, it doesn't even make sense on, a, on the most cursory level. But anyway, um, so now we have the president saying, you know, all these people voted illegally. I'm going to form this commission, which, by the way, is chaired by Chris Kobach, same guy. Um, so the first thing the commission did to look into what they call voter integrity, was they asked every state to send their voter file to the Fed, to this commission. Um, and they asked for a whole list of information, personal information, on every voter in the country. I think it's a very dangerous idea for a whole lot of reasons, not least of which we have had problems with the cybersecurity of our elections lately. So probably it's a bad idea to have that all that list in one place. Uh, but more than that, I felt strongly that uh, this would violate people's personal privacy. Now these lists were made to be, it's a voter file. It's to give the election officials information about who, who can and should vote and who's on the list. It was never intended to be uh, a document that places in one place every <coughs> voting citizen's information. Uh, by the way, not in a place that was going to be available to the public. So I refused. Uh, I will continue to refuse, even though, you know, on some level, there is a lot of information that is publicly disclosable. So there will be legislation uh, that I will try to get introduced uh, to change that situation. Because right now, under FOI laws, I am required to sell the database to anyone who asks for it for $350. Um, now our database does not contain people's social security numbers, does not contain their military records, does not contain who they voted for, or it does contain voter history. So 
I would like to restrict some of that. I got more mail about this than I've ever gotten about anything, and I'm on the side of the public on this one. I think it's inappropriate to give an entire set of information about people. Their identities can be stolen if, they, if you have three pieces of data, including name, address, birth date. Uh, I'm learning all this now since this came up. but uh, So I will propose legislation that will restrict some of that information from being divulged to the public. Um, and under certain circumstances. And there will be a public hearing about it. Uh, I can give you more information once we kind of get through the public hearing process. Um, there will be, I will make other proposals. I don't think it should be usable for commercial purposes, for example. Uh, we did have a guy in New Hampshire who, he was a very bad actor. He bought the list and then put it on the, on the internet, published it to the web, and then said, for five dollars, you can get your name off this horrible list that the Secretary of State is selling your data. And for five bucks, I can take you off this list. That kind of thing. Um, people were very upset. That was a couple of years ago. He's still doing it. Um, it is a snapshot in time, so it's, you know. And uh, so anyway, there will be a public hearing. It should be very interesting because it's, it's kind of a complicated issue because we have very strong FOI laws in this state. And there are reasons for that as well. I've always been a strong proponent of freedom of information. Uh, but I think this crosses a line. And I, I hope we can restrict it in a way that will not harm people's uh, personal data. So that's one piece of what I'm doing. Uh, the other one I want to talk about is early voting. And this goes in line with everything else I've done during my administration which is go the complete opposite direction of everything else these states are doing. I want there to be more opportunities and possibilities for people to vote. You know, of course within the framework that we have, which of course checks to make sure you're 18 year old and a citizen. By the way, those are the only two things that you need to be a voter. So all the rest of it is restrictive. And personally, I mean, I don't want to be radical here, but you know, once somebody turns 18 and they're a citizen, shouldn't they just be a voter? <laughs> I don't know why we're going through all this. But anyway, uh, but at the very least, we should have the same opportunities that 38 other states have, which is to vote on some day besides election day. I've been working on this for years, um, and it breaks my heart when people come up to me and say, why can't we have early voting like all those other states? Why aren't you championing it? Well, I've been championing it for 20 years, actually. Uh, and what happened was, we got it has to be a constitutional amendment. We're back to the same issue Lori was talking about. Because our state, cons state constitution now says that you can only vote on this one day. And that you can only get absentee ballots for this specific set of reasons. It's a very unusual provision. Constitutions don't usually get down to the nuts and bolts of how we do things. And um, I'm about to write an article for the, one of the historical magazines about how that all happened. But we have to change the Constitution. So in 2012, uh, the House and Senate both passed uh, a bill that I introduced uh, that just said, let's just take that language out of the Constitution. And, and come up with whatever system makes sense for the time, because it's going to keep changing, you know. Uh, so we got it passed, the House and Senate, not by enough. Because in order to get it right onto the ballot, you have to get a three-fifths, three-fourths vote in both houses. Now, here's where we get to the partisan part. <coughs> this idea of being able to vote on some days besides election days has been very nonpartisan in most states. Uh, in Vermont, the issue passed unanimously in both houses. Somehow, between that time when all those other states did that and now, it has become partisan. And there's a lot of mythology, I think, about it because the Republicans like the idea of no fault absentee ballots, like not having to have an excuse to get an absentee ballot. Why? Because a lot of their constituents commute to New York. And so they think, well, this will advantage us because our constituents now will be able to vote, you know, we'll be, we'll be able to get absentee ballots more easily. Um, 
Democrats like early voting because they think, oh, that means more of our people are going to get to vote because a lot of our people are, let's say, more middle class. Maybe you have to take time off work. Maybe you don't have child care. You know, Tuesday is not a convenient day for most people. And so I think this mythology has grown up that an advantage is one side or another. And that has made us get kind of stuck. So we passed it, not with the three-fourths, but with uh, a healthy majority in 2012, with the language that just says, let's just take all that out of the state constitution. It, it had to pass again uh, the next year, in 2013. It did. It went on the ballot. And the language that was on the ballot, I think, this is my reasoning, I don't know, but anyway, it failed on the ballot. It was voted down, uh, did not pass. 2014, it was gubernatorial year, but it was all worked up about the gubernatorial election. And when you read the question on the ballot, frankly, it didn't make a lot of sense and made people nervous that they were like going to let the legislature pass the laws about voting. I mean, what a concept. The legislature, by the way, passes laws on everything. But, you know, uh, it was just not the right year for that language, I would suggest. And also, people thought that it said that they were getting a right taken away. I remember some people coming out of the voting booth and said to me, I voted against that terrible issue, you know, where they were going to take away my right to vote. I thought, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> so, and in short, after all that work on the, on the part of numerous groups, advocacy groups, the public wants it. Uh, I think it's very popular with the public. Um, uh, it went down. So, uh, I introduced another version of it last year, which I will bring back this year. It did not pass um, with sufficient votes. Passed in the House with about 51%. Uh, this version of early voting is more modest. So I tried to take a cue from what happened, and this would allow some days of early voting besides just the Tuesday, but only within the first week before the election. A lot of people were concerned about something happened in Montana a couple of years ago, and people voted for some guy who turned out to be a really bad guy, and they didn't know it, they all wanted their ballots back, remember that? Well, people are concerned about that. What if something horrible happens between the time I vote, you know, a month earlier? And, I mean, by the way, an election is always a snapshot in time. You're never going to know everything. But I agree, I think it shouldn't probably be that long before the election. But there should be some additional opportunities. I think my favorite version would be some form of weekend voting plus Tuesday. Something like that. Um, and maybe not opening all the polling places. The other concern was it's going to cost more money to keep all these polling places open. Frankly, it doesn't cost that much. But even if you want to address that, maybe it just would be a town hall over the weekend. And then you go vote at all the polling, you know. That would have to be decided later. We first have to get past this first threshold. It's terribly important. I do think it will be many more people voting. It gives them more opportunities to vote. And I think anything we can do to do that, we should do. We now have online voter registration, which I've gotten past. We have registration at the DMV with automatic voter registration. We have election day registration, which now means even if you're inappropriately not on the list, your name isn't there, it's the biggest problem we get on election day, you're still allowed to register and vote if you can come up with the identification necessary. So we've got a lot of liberalization. We do have 100,000 more registered voters in Connecticut than we've ever had before. Oh. It works. And it's all these measures that have helped that happen. I think we need to go that one step further and make sure that people have additional opportunities to vote, just like the rest of the country. Um, so, I need help. I will tell you that when it passed last year, uh, there were only two Republican votes in the House, and they were not from this area. Uh, the two Republican votes were Libby Florin in Greenwich and Devin Carney, who's from somewhere down on the shoreline. Uh, Libby is a longtime League of Women Voters member um, and she, she has been strongly in favor. She is the only Republican in the House. In the Senate, it's possible, if I can get it called in the Senate, and get it out of the committee, 
biggest problem with this bill is the senator, Senator McLaughlin, who is the co-chair, because we now have co-chairs in the Senate, because it's 1818, so there's a Republican and a Democrat chair, which has meant we can't get much done, frankly, right? I mean, it's tough. And, and Senator McLaughlin is opposed to early voting. I'm very clear about that. So it was hard for me to even get it out of his committee. And he does have something to say about whether you hear it in the Senate. But I do, uh, Senator Whitcoast has voted for it in the past. And he's kind of from up here, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and so probably could be persuaded to vote for it again, um, should it come up. I haven't talked to him this year, but I think it's possible. Uh, Senator France uh, from Greenwich the other day at a big League of Women Voters slash Indivisible meeting expressed interest when asked. See, these are the important things about forums like this and opportunities to, to ask people where they stand on this. Because the truth is, most people don't follow state uh, politics that much. You know, we're busy seeing what Trump had for breakfast, but we don't know what anybody's voting on here in our state. And I, and I get that, you know, you only have so much time in your life for this. But um, it's really, really important to know where people stand on these things and what they're actually gonna do and put them on the spot. So I can tell you, you know, Senator Whitcoast expressed, uh, has voted for it in the past. Uh, Senator France just for the first time said publicly, you know, maybe I can consider that. And uh, Senator Logan, from the Valley, not Naugatuck Valley, uh, the only uh, African-American uh, Republican senator uh, expressed interest. So that's where I am. But our senator hasn't. Oh no, he's he's both. Yeah, he's both. Mm -hmm. As are all your state representatives, except my dear friend Michelle. <laughs> uh, this, and, and as I say, it has become a partisan issue for reasons I don't really quite understand except that there is this national sense that opening up voting is bad thing. Uh, and that, you know, the, the Republican Party is somehow disadvantaged. And, you know, all the, the, the talk about voter fraud and the other, the othering of our society, and that's really at the root of it. We're back to the Civil War. It's, I haven't seen laws like that since the poll tax, and these are a version of the poll tax, make no mistake. It's the same dynamic. Uh, and so I think we just have to fight back, like on everything else, because we will lose our democracy if we start putting in restrictions about who can actually participate. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you can help me out. Um, she is running for re-election, and there are contribution forms. It's public financing in Connecticut, so any donation between five and hundred dollars is legal. And um, anyway, the forms are out there, and I hope you'll grab one and fill it out for her. Um, so she can make the threshold that she needs to statewide um, to qualify for public financing.